Hi, everybody. Welcome to Five Minutes After the Hour, Jackson Community Church, the church of everything goes wrong just to give us fun, even when we spend 90 minutes getting it right first. Now I'm doing that again. Who has a guess why I'm wearing this mask? Somebody in Zoom have a guess? If you do, go ahead, Jeanette. You have to unmute, though. Because there's a Mardi Gras celebration tomorrow. Oh, yes, there's a Mardi Gras celebration tomorrow. Um, tomorrow night, 6.30 to 8, DeMarco Alvarez will be playing jazz piano for us. So you are more than welcome to come. We have beads, masks. Come in your own bling if you have it. Enjoy your friends, dance, take photos. It's a tradition we started five years ago. It went dormant for a year or two during COVID. It's back. It's a little different every year because we have different musicians. And some years we can serve food. We are not serving food this year. So come with a full belly or go home hungry and eat afterwards. We'll feed you in so many other ways, but not food. OK. That was my um, one of my two community service announcements for today. The second is that Lent begins this week. Uh, there will be the, the opportunity to receive ashes several places and times in Jackson. I will send out an email for all of those times and places, and you can come find me. There will be a 7 o'clock Ash Wednesday service. So if you didn't find me in one of my ashes to go spots all around town, you are more than welcome to come to the worship service, which will again be a hybrid of Zoom and in person. I will also have cards with crosses drawn in ash at the front of the church. So if you wanna come privately and just receive the cross made of ash and take it home with you with a reading, you're welcome to do that. There are many ways to begin your Lenten journey, but it starts on Wednesday preceded, of course, by Mardi Gras. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. We are going to mail out Lenten devotionals to anybody who's long distance or anybody that's having a hard time getting out of their house. There are Lenten devotionals in the front of the church. So if you want to take one, please do. And just write your name down so we know that we don't have to mail one to you because um, we have enough to go around, but we, I don't want to duplicate with mailings if, if you've taken one personally. Yeah, so write your name down. <laughs> um, and there will be additional mailings and meditations all about Lent. So as we partake of the theme of journey together, we are embarking on the journey from Lent to Easter together starting this week. And we're doing part of it with celebration with Mardi Gras. So now I'm gonna take off the feather boa probably dangerous even to take the bow off. And ask, are there any other announcements for the life of the church? Meg, go ahead. Yeah, we're bringing a microphone to Meg. The mission committee is asking people to prayerfully consider donations to the Chikanga Church uh, the church is trying to put up the last truss and complete the construction of the roof of their new church. And if you are interested in having a way to um, commemorate the days of Lent, perhaps you could put a certain amount of money aside every day of Lent. And at the end, we will be sending a large donation that the mission committee has already set aside for the um, finishing the roof but they need many thousands of dollars to do this. So we ask you to prayerfully consider if this is a way you would like to um, spend your days of Lent putting some money aside for that. And there'll be more information in the next church newsletter exactly with what is happening about the church roof. Thank you. So raising the roof, we're gonna help the Chikanga Church and we'll tell you more about how you can participate. Additionally, this Tuesday is a deacon's meeting at 7 o'clock. Um, we will send out a reminder, but we're preparing for our Lenten journey together, so it's important if you can possibly attend that if you're a deacon. We would appreciate your input as we think about how we're going to take the Lenten journey together. 
Other announcements for the life of the church? Anybody in Zoom or anybody here who needs to make an announcement? Whatever it is, whether we do technology or any of this stuff, we try to do busy things before we get into the worship service so that when we enter the worship service, we are focused on being present in the, together and welcoming love into this place. And so we're going to do that now. I invite you to put your feet on the floor, relax your bodies, take a really deep breath in, and then let it out. Close your eyes and receive the gift of this centering music played by Alan. Thank you, Ellen. We turn now to our call to worship. If you are in Zoom, you will find the words to the call to worship on your screen. If you're here in the sanctuary, you'll find the words in your bulletin. I want to acknowledge that Sandy is our virtual deacon today, and she's doing all the work behind the scenes, and you get to even see her. so. Um, send her a lot of love and gratitude for the courage to be our virtual person. This is adapted from a poem by Wendell Berry. Always in big woods when you leave familiar ground and step off alone into a new place, there will be, along with the feelings of curiosity and excitement, a little nagging of dread. You are undertaking the first experience, not of the place, but of yourself in that place. It is only after we have discovered it for ourselves that it becomes a common ground and a common bond, and we cease to be alone. but only by a spiritual journey, a journey of one inch, very arduous and humbling and joyful, by which we arrive at the ground at our feet and learn to be at home. During this part of our service, we pray together. And the power of gathering in person, whether you are here through Zoom or whether you are here in body in our sanctuary, is that we lift up our prayers out loud if we are able, but even when we hold silence, we do it in community. And we focus our energy on the prayers that we are all sharing. And we lift all of these up to God, to holy love, to the one who draws close and listens to all things, spoken and unspoken. We always begin with prayers of concern, and let me start our list with the names of those for whom we pray each week and a few that have been added particularly this week. We pray for Ray and Arden on the journey through hospice. We pray for Huntley, for Scamp, for Sasha and her granddaughter Mary, for Sue and her upcoming surgery, for Ralph, for Richard Augustine and Joyce Augustine, 
for Barry and for Jan, for Cindy and her family, for Anjali and Dottie in their healing, for Richard and Sandra, for Candace and her family, for a dear friend of one of our congregants, Aaron, for the care that he needs and the other challenges that he is tackling right now, for Ben and his family, for Michael and for Kevin. These are the names of those that we know to lift up together out loud. We add also the place in the world that is in the midst of conflict, the Ukraine. And we pray for both Russia and the Ukraine and for all other nations that are engaged one way or another in this conflict. For those who have not chosen war, but it has come to them anyway. For those who have the power to choose peace instead. And for all those who have a voice or a way to influence these events and for other parts of the world where indeed those who are on the front lines of defense or caregiving or emergency response are going into harm's way again and again and again, whether it is our military, our fire and police, our medical workers, our EMTs, sometimes our mountain rescue teams, all the different kinds of people that go into places that most of us would not dare and put their bodies and their minds and their hearts into those places to care for those who need that care. We hold them in the light. If you here in this community have prayers of concern that you want to share out loud, we invite them now. And we'll begin here in the sanctuary and then we'll move to Zoom. So is there anyone here in the sanctuary who has a prayer, if you do, please raise your hand because we ask you to speak into a microphone so that Zoom can hear, which as you know, matters a lot to us. Bob has one. Bunny and I asked for prayers for her friend, Aaron. Thank you, Bob. For Aaron, for Sue, go ahead. We need to pray for our friend, Jean, um, who's not having a good day. For Jean, and for a, a tough day, may there be better ones. Any other prayers of concern here in the sanctuary? Prayers of concern in Zoom. If so, please unmute and go ahead and speak up. Okay, you're quiet. I either recovered all your prayers or you're going to say them silently later or you'll think of them later. Then, given the heaviness of world events and even our own personal concerns, we remind ourselves and each other that we walk through this world with gratitude. That when we walk with that spirit of appreciation and perspective, for the gifts and the blessings that are ours, it will help guide us through the darkest of times and remind us what love looks like in our lives. And so if you have prayers of appreciation or celebration or hope, please, we would love to hear those as well. And we'll begin again in Zoom. So Zoom, I hope you're happy today and have something lovely to share with us. We could use your cheer. Please unmute if you do. Miss Deanna celebrated her 57th birthday this week. Lovely. A 57th <laughs> birthday for Deanna, who's had her own health challenges. And um, we celebrated her wedding just a few years ago. And we're glad that you're out there. Like, she's always out there doing something crazy, throwing frying pans, water skiing, all kinds of stuff. Jan, go ahead. Um, I just want to say yesterday was the second anniversary of Barry's accident ski accident. It was two years ago yesterday that he became paralyzed. But this week he had two driving lessons with the hand controls in our van. So wow. we're making progress. Thank you everyone for your prayers too. 
It makes a difference. Driving lessons for Barry two years after his um, the accident that paralyzed him. Hank and Linda, do you have a prayer? Uh, yes, we were excited that our grandson was chosen uh, to be on the team to represent New England, which also includes New York at the Junior Nationals Nordic Championship that will start on a week from now in Minneapolis. And what's your grandson's name? Nate. Nate. So prayers for Nate as he represents New England in the Junior Nationals and um, prayers of joy for you to appreciate him and cheer him on. And may he have a sense of accomplishment and also, you know, self-esteem and resilience so that he knows that he is gifted, but also that he is more than even his sport, right? That he is a whole person and we are proud of all the parts of him and honor all the parts of him. Other, um, Ginger, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just thankful to God for a um, safe travel mercies um, to and from the UAE and just all the uh, people that we're able to meet there and um, we're very grateful to be back home in America. Mm. So prayers for gratitude for safe travels and a very enriching experience. Uh, David and Ginger traveled back through the snowstorm uh, on Friday, so they can personally attest that was a kind of a hazardous journey, but you're safe here and we're grateful that you made it back. And I love that phrase, traveling mercies. So I appreciate that you lift up, especially during our theme of Lent, the theme of traveling mercies that we may experience along the way. Other prayers of gratitude in Zoom. Okay, then I'm gonna to turn to our congregation here in the church. Is there anybody that wants to share? Oh, come on. Oh, Sue's happy. The Cardinals were at the feeder this morning and they are my favorite birds, which of course are still in our, in our church and I love the Cardinals. <laughs> but the other thing is, I don't know whether it's, when the icicles come crashing from the upper roof to the lower roof, it sounds, it is horrific noise <laughs> and it always jars me. So are we happy for that? Well, I guess so. It's, for scary sound it's, of icicles falling? No, it's, it's something that you don't hear in <laughs> California. Okay. Okay. All right. So it's a New England, it's, it's part of the percussive melody of New England with the icicle. Other prayers of happiness or celebration. Sometimes we hear reports of wildlife sightings and uh, Ken's neighborhood has a bobcat that you guys at least see the footprints of. And our friend Bruce has witnessed coyotes hunting a deer. Um, so all kinds of interesting activity, even in the middle of winter, the world is alive and moving. So keeping us on our toes, I ask that you will join me now in silence. Oh, holy God, we lift up to you the names, the bodies, the minds, and the hearts of those who are part of our community. And we ask that you will be present where you are required for healing, for compassion, for justice, for dignity, for companionship through every step of what it means to be human, even unto death. And that you will be the love that receives us when we pass across the threshold from this life to the next, but that you will be with us every step and every breath and every heartbeat along the way. We lift up places in this world that are indeed undergoing conflict right now and the people who respond to these situations. 
we ask that you will remind us that you are the bright spot of the red cardinal, that you are the coyote hunting, that you are the blue sky and the light glinting on the new snow, that you are the dark night and you are the dawn. You are what love looks like when we know it has touched our lives. And you are the presence that we can only discern when we look backwards over events and realize that something kept us here, kept us alive, attended to us and brought us through when we thought we were alone. You are the love who will not leave us no matter what day, no matter what choice we may make on our journey, there is nothing we can do, nothing we can choose to separate ourselves from you. You will find us and you will be with us. That is the promise of your love. We speak now the words that you first taught us, saying the Lord's Prayer. And I ask that those who are in Zoom would unmute so that we can hear your voices lifted up with ours in the sanctuary. You'll find the words in your bulletin or they're up on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread. Daily. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. The first song that we're going to sing is pretty familiar to all of you by now. It's song 374. We're going to sing all five verses. The words will either be up on the screen or you can find them in your red hymnal, page 374. Please rise if you're able, if you're here in the sanctuary, to sing, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant? And now we turn to readings from the scripture, and I would invite both Lori and Autumn forward. This is a long reading. You will find it in your bulletin, so you can read along with everyone. These are excerpts from Mark chapter 6, verses 6 through 44. Lori's going to read the first two scenes, and Autumn will read the final one. Good morning. Can you hear me? A little louder? Yes. 
That's good. <clears throat> Mark 6, 6 through 44. The mission of the 12. Then he, Jesus, went about among the villages teaching. He called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to leave you, and my dog is clawing at the carpet, Axel, stop. Excuse me. <clears throat> he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as testimony to them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The death of John Baptist. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the Baptista has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his couriers, courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and behead him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and he gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Feeding the 5,000, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure to even eat. They went away in their boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot for all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. 
they said to him, Are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the grass. So they sat down in groups of 500 and of 50s. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed the broke and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. They took up the 12 baskets of full broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, Lori. Please pray with me. O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning at the eight o'clock gathering, we read poetry about friends. And in point of fact, we ended up reading one poem at the end of the gathering. But first, we looked up the lyrics to the Simon and Garfunkel song. Is that right? It was um, called Old Friends. Does anybody know that song? It launched us into this whole conversation about friendships, how far back they go in our lives. What is the, who's the oldest friend in your life? You know, how long have you known somebody? They may not be your best friend or your closest friend, but you may have relationships either within your family or within your community that go back as far as your earliest memories or your early years in elementary school. For some of us, those relationships begin in high school or college or even in a workplace, depending on whether we were living in the same place for a long time or we had traveled often and moved frequently in our younger years. We talked about the richness of what it means to even be able to say, I have a friend that has known me since I was a baby or since third grade or since our junior year in high school or when we took that class together in college or when we roomed together, when we worked in the same place. To have those relationships with people that know you across so many years is a gift. And perhaps for many of us, it's easy to make friends, but for some people it isn't. For some people, they may have a neurological difference or an emotional difference that makes forming attachments or maintaining relationships very challenging. So the first thing that we should remember is to be grateful that our capacity to form relationships gives us the richness of relationships. They may come and go. They may not all endure. Perhaps you are friends with people who you developed intimacy with because you did live close by. They were a neighbor and it was easy to go out and do things together or see them frequently. And then when you move away from that place or your life changes, you don't run across each other as much. And those relationships fade into the memory, although sometimes they can be rekindled. Other people are those that you might not see for decades, but the minute that you pick up the phone or you run across each other, you can sit down and it's like no time has passed. There are people with whom you forge strong connections because of extreme experiences in the cancer ward. I lived in the same room with my child and other parents whose children were also struggling with a life-limiting condition. And the friendships that we forged are enduring. We may not see each other often, but when we see each other, we have a shared experience that transcends time and distance. And the same is true in any kind of extreme situation. People that serve in the military together, people that endure all kinds of amazing, you train for a certain event together and you, and you 
are each other's buddies through something, people that you meet when you're striving for sobriety, people that become your coaches or your teachers when you're trying to learn something new. There are so many ways that we form relationships that may have a particular sphere of connection for us, those relationships that were formed even in things like COVID. And yet we know there are people that don't have those relationships. So let us bear that in mind. When we think about the first story in this scripture, again, we are talking about the length of journey that lasts a lifetime. From the time you draw breath to the time you walk up to the threshold of your mortality and you cross it. Because this is the journey that we are taking when we walk the way of Christ. It is a human journey. And every story has something human about it. And so in the first of the stories, the first that Lori read, Christ is surrounded by people that are following him, that believes that he is there to do something big and to change the world, beginning with their own hearts and lives. And he sends them out ahead of himself into other communities to tell people about why he's there and, and to find out if they would want to change their lives. But he doesn't send them alone. He sends them in teams of two so that each person has somebody else with whom they are building a deeper connection and they are not isolated and alone on their journey. They will do this together and they will lean on each other. They will teach each other and when they come back, their relationship will be different. It will be changed. And they will need each other in the years to come. Because the one that they have chosen to follow will not stay with them. And yet they will go on to tell the story of what it was like to walk with him. And they will imagine with others how big and how connected the world can be if love is how you lead, if love is how you try to find and meet and know each other. They don't do it alone. Just as we don't take our journeys alone, though we may be lonely sometimes, we seek out community because we need each other. And yet it's also important to think about this particular part of the journey as being one that reflects on the relationship between Jesus and his cousin, John. John was born almost the same time as Jesus, a few months ahead of him. And John's own father prophesied that he would prepare the way for Christ, that he would go out into the world and change hearts and minds and proclaim a new era when the Messiah was coming. And indeed, we know from stories that John fulfilled this purpose, that as an adult, the next time we meet him, he is wearing kind of wild clothes and he's eating locusts and honey and he's baptizing tons of people and he's well known all over the countryside and he has a ton of followers. And Jesus, seeks out John to be baptized as he begins his own journey where he will be tested. And some of his followers come from those who had first chosen to follow John. They'll peel away and they'll begin to follow Jesus. And right around here, right in these stories, we're hearing that their paths are parting ways. John is extremely political already. He is criticizing the king, who is the governor appointed and authorized by the Romans in their land. This king, although he is Jewish, does not often follow Jewish law. He is straddling Roman culture and Jewish culture and other pluralistic cultures. And John criticizes him and criticizes the women in his life. And any guy who's ever criticized a woman knows that's a dangerous thing to do. But no joke, it was a political act. Because one of the stories in the Bible that's actually attested to through external sources is the beheading of John. 
Josephus, who's a historian of that time, writes about this incident in the court of Herod and writes about John. He never writes about Jesus, but he writes about John and this moment. When John got so up in the face of the authorities and was so problematic that they executed him. And remember that Jesus is connected to this man. He is blood, he is family. They have had a shared purpose. Many of their friends they hold in common. And yet their paths are diverging here. By the time we get to this story that Autumn read for us, where the followers of Jesus who were sent out in pairs are coming back to him and they're hungry and they're tired. They haven't really taken care of themselves very well. Jesus is weary too. His cousin has been executed. And he advises his followers that they should set apart some time and space and take care of themselves. And in other versions of this story, he too is grieving and he too wants to draw apart because he needs to gather himself and center himself. He's already been preaching and healing, performing miracles around the countryside. But things are getting hot now. His cousin is dead and the eyes of the community, the eyes of Israel, the eyes of the Roman government and the king are all turning to him, and he has choices to make. Will he be a political messiah, the one that they hoped would come through the gates of Jerusalem on a great steed, dressed in armor, with a rallied cry for other warriors and revolutionaries who want to overthrow the oppressive regime that has had its thumb on them for so long? So many of them hope that this is who he will be. John perhaps anticipated that this is who he would be. This political man who, like John, would raise his fist and speak to the king, even to the point of risking death. And though we know that Jesus, too, will be executed, the way that he defies and resists the government and the injustices embedded even within his own religious community are different. And this is where those differences begin to emerge. When people come back tired from their journey in teams of two and they try to draw apart, crowds who would have depended on John, who have now begun to follow Christ, follow them where they try to retreat to. The crowds follow them with no supplies. They're hungry, those crowds of people who are seeking a word from Christ or a miracle or a sign and guidance about what comes next when the world is crashing down and people are being executed. And what does he do? He doesn't get up on the mountain and start preaching to them. He doesn't draw apart and say, I'll talk to you later. He instructs these tired, weary teams of men. Maybe there were women there too. To go feed the crowds of people that have turned to them for leadership and hope and healing and a word that will change their lives. And that as the disciples so often are, are confused. What, you want us to, we left our houses with no money. You said, take a sandal and one staff. You said, don't bring anything else. Where are we gonna get the denarii to go buy all the bread that we would need to feed all these people? Notice the math, Sue noticed it on Friday. They count 5,000 people, but those are just the men, the heads of the household. This crowd is much larger than 5,000. There are women and children there too. How are they going to feed all those people? And Christ asked them to take stock of what is among them and use it to feed everybody. And we know it becomes a miracle. 
the loaves and the fishes, they multiply miraculously so much so that at the end of giving everybody everything that they needed to fulfill themselves, there's stuff left over. 12 baskets of leftovers. They could keep on feeding more people. He took care of their bodies first. He took care of their essential needs. He paid attention to the first thing that the people that turned to him required. And it wasn't a big conceptual love or a message of mercy, not yet. The first thing they needed was food. Because who can listen to you or hope for anything else if they have a hungry belly and their mind is distracted? Or they're worried about somebody else who, because their blood sugar is about to spike or crash, can't make it through the day. He paid attention to the first need first. After this story, there's going to be a story about Jesus calming the waters and walking on the waters because they'll withdraw in a boat. And when they land on the far shore, they are no longer in Israel, which is the place that John had preached his whole life. John limited his message to Israel. But part of what happens on the journey of Christ is that he goes outside his comfort zone. He goes beyond the people that traditionally we would think that he's turning to, to become good news, the Messiah, the one who's gonna change everything. He goes into Gentile communities and he takes his message and his people there. And he begins to understand his presence in the world in a different way. But that's another story for another day. Just know that this morning in these stories, this man that we are following on his journey has experienced the de death of a beloved companion, is beginning to question exactly how he will serve those who are turning to him. And he's changing the message that he is teaching people to turn to each other and find what they need in each other and know that they will be enough and more than enough for each other on the journey. And that even Christ needs companionship as do all of us. And so the question becomes, who do we choose? Who do we bring along on our life's journey? Not just between this Ash Wednesday and Easter, but our whole life long. Who are the people that keep turning up for us? Who are the new relationships that offer what we didn't know we even needed? I bet every one of you has friendships that you can point to that span the course of years and distances. Chris and I have good friends named Mark and Leslie who are from Ipswich, England. And we first met them because we were in a rotary club that was doing cultural exchanges, Ipswich, Massachusetts to Ipswich, England. And every two years we would go back and forth and we would stay in their house and then they would come and stay in our house two years later. We embarked on this adventure between two bouts of Jesse's cancer. So Mark and Leslie met us when Jesse's body had already been irrevocably changed when our family was different than before we began our cancer journey. But we thought that she was in remission and would stay so. And we could start to have these adventures of forming new relationships, inviting people to live in our house with us, messy and unusual as that could sometimes be with young children. And they dove in with full hearts and got to know both of our girls and built the first foundations of a long friendship. And then we brought our girls to England and Jessie traveled internationally, even though she was on cancer treatment. And Sarah went up in that, you know, on the big uh, Ferris wheel that's in London. And we had all these adventures and we've continued to know each other across time. They have known each other in crazy slices of life. They knew us the summer after Jesse died when we traveled again with them. They have seen us at our most excruciating 
and our most joyful moments. And we can count on our hands the number of times we've met them in our years of living. And yet the two weeks that we spend with them every few years have established a relationship that will last until we draw our last breaths. We will always be in each other's lives. When love shows up for you, love shows up as a real person. We need each other. And the love that we are talking about, that we are studying, that we are celebrating as we move towards Easter is real. And it lives in every one of you. It lives in this group that chose to gather, whether you are here in Zoom or you are here in body. It lives in our sister church, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutari in the nation of Zimbabwe, raising the roof on their church. It lives in the face and the hands of the Russian soldiers as it lives in the woman who stood up, as she said in the news, with her handful of seeds and defied a soldier and said, take these seeds, that something good may come even if you die. Love shows up in crazy places and it defies you to turn away from it. And even if you do, it will follow you. You may not know it, but love will not leave you alone. Know that when you are on the journey that you are taking, love is always walking with you. Thanks be to God. This is the beginning of the Lenten season. And so when we remind you in this time of offering that we rely on your financial giving as well as your time, be reminded that truly what is being asked of you is your whole heart and your whole self offered to love. Open yourselves that love may find you and walk with you and change you. Offer more than just your money or your time. Open your heart and your mind to the gift of love. I'm going to turn us now to the next song in our worship service, Simple Gifts. You'll find it on page 207 in the red hymnal, or you will find the words up on your screen. It's two verses. Please stand if you're able, and we're going to move directly from Tis a Gift to be Simple to the benediction song, which will follow.
brothers and sisters, we invite you to enjoy the bling of celebration, but we also invite you as this journey begins to take off your masks, turn yourselves towards love, be vulnerable, be available, and find out what comes next. Go with the peace of hope and vulnerability and love. Go in peace.